Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming on this very inhospitable, cold evening to give up your time. Um, we have a distinguished guest speaker, but before I introduce our guest speaker, I would like, first of all, to thank Sherry, who can't hear me, but he's gone out, but he spends his life organizing these events. He organized one here last night. He's here again tonight. So Sherry, if you can't hear me, but thank you very much for putting in the effort. Um, our speaker tonight is uh, an old friend of mine. We're both quite old. Speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking for you, actually, not me. <laughs> Um, we've known each other for many years at the university because Bill, I think, is the only archaeologist who ever was working for the university. Dr. Bard. Sorry? Dr. Bard before you. Oh, Bard before you, yeah. right. Long time. Solomon. Health, health director, health yeah. service director yes. before the, he went to government. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, during my time here, you've been the only archaeologist yeah. around the place, so we've right. chatted. Um, Bill... He's very famous in Hong Kong. He's carried out a lot of archaeology, both in Hong Kong and uh, in the States. He's also written the leading Hong Kong authority on archaeology, published by OUP. Um, and he also um, is a great fighter for what he believes in, as I think we shall find out tonight. Um, so thank you all very much for coming. Um, there will be loads of time for questions, but I must apologize in advance that I am going to go at eight minutes past seven because I have a, a commitment I can't avoid. I'm very sorry. Um, so I'm going to walk out of here, but Bill is totally able to take over. So if you've got questions, we book this room until 7.30. You're very, very welcome to stay behind and chat, ask questions, share views, etc. But please excuse me. So, tonight's topic is a totally non controversial, boring topic of the, uh, the tension between confidentiality and the sort of right of the public to know. And it is a, an insoluble problem as far as I can see, but I bet Bill has a solution. All right, thank you, Michael. Um, I'm going to cover a lot of material, ladies and gentlemen, very in, in an hour and, what did we say, eight minutes, no, approximately? Three minutes now. <laughs> okay. Um, might go past that. But you all have a copy of the CD, right? This one? Is that okay? Testing? So everything that I mentioned in here tonight is in this CD in great detail. So if you're interested in one or two points in particular, you can go to there and read the anecdotes, all the inside stuff, maybe some borderline slander, libel, I don't know, it's been tested yet in court. Um, there's the contents for you to see, and um, you'll notice that in brackets, that's number of pages. The synagogue had about like 70 pages in this uh, e-book. E it was a big battle, and I'll cover that for about 20 minutes. But you can see there's other, including two contributions from, from other people. One, David Russell, wrote a re retrospective. He wrote that in 2006. And this paper by Elizabeth Seen was written in 1987. So that would work perfectly because that was right before the synagogue case broke as a big heritage battle. Now, the main features of the government influence on and dominance of statutory bodies. And these are all very much debated. Everybody, oops, everybody knows that appointed members is sort of the main lever by which government uses controls, even the district councils and EXCO, of course. Secrecy of operation, control of the agenda and information, confidentiality requirement that's been discussed a lot lately, uh, resistance to input from experts and groups in the community, and civil servants always there. And not all of these apply all the time. And to the Antiquities Advisory Board, I've got examples of most of them at different times with different chairmen. Some of the tools of the trade that of the government, I was going to call this dirty tricks, but actually the, some of these are quite legal and quite proper. They make authoritative statements. They selectively provide information. They, uh, whoops, they sometimes select delegations to attend the meetings without telling the members. That happened a couple of times. 
document dumps, as they call it in the US, where a whole bunch of documents are shoved onto your desk or sent by email now the night before, two days before. Motions pass sometimes by email with assent assumed, if there's no or one or two objections. Shield members from the public. Now, this is something that happens even today, even right now, in the Antiquities Advisory Board. I'll give you a few examples of that. And also, punish members who go too far in their criticism. And this is an example right here, as you'll see. Now, the appointed members. This is one of the main things that I ran up against when I was appointed to the board. But even before, you could, I, I sensed this in the early 70s, which in the bad old days, that they're generally unavailable, very difficult to contact, they hardly ever reply to any submissions from members of the public. And a lot of them are interested in future government appointments. So this is good for the resume, more community service, and uh, possible promotion. So they kind of become, in many cases, loyal to the authority that appointed them, and hence pro-government. And a lot of times they're unwilling to investigate, to carefully examine the evidence, even university members, sadly enough. And a lot of times they collectively rely on civil servants to, quote, explain things. Now I'll give you examples of most of these later on. Talking about the Antiquities and Monuments Ordinance, it was uh, passed in 1971, enacted, brought into effect in 1976. And it was mainly due to pressure from archaeologists that got this thing passed. And that's why I say, oops, uh, be careful what you wish for because this turned into a North Korean type totalitarian control of archaeology by the government. However, they did, um, and here's the, some of the pressure. Dr. Bard in 1964 was a, was a member of this university archaeological team and he wrote that they've been promoting this new bill for historic relics soon to be passed into law. Professor Davis uh, in geology and geography wrote in 1970-71 how disappointed he was that this wasn't passed yet. And um, he went on to say that this is uh, impossible to estimate how much has been lost because of government's dilly-dallying, and the relics of the past are important evidence of Hong Kong heritage, must be preserved. Sure, everybody agrees. Well, it did get passed in 71. And here's one of the readings, in second or third reading in, Leg in LegCo, where they said that this was going to be uh, passed, and it was also, um, the government would have to be show care and discretion in the detailed application of this. This field in which government has little previous experience and um, it, it's however going to hopefully not, hopefully not deprive future generations of all record of their culture and antecedents. That's 76. This is the law as it's passed. There have been a couple of amendments. This is 82. But you'll see that they set it up so that the chairman was a civil servant and uh, the deputy, the vice chairman was also a civil servant. And then there were other members as being appointed by the governor. One thing, though, that maybe they hadn't thought of or maybe later they regretted was this. Procedure at the meeting shall be such as the board may determine. Once when things really got heated, the chairman did not want to take a vote. He, he said, I, I declare the meeting adjourned. And we said, wait, well, hold on. This is up to the members. And he turned to the crown council and said, and he said, well, yeah, uh, item, item five. So he couldn't adjourn the meeting. He could convene the meeting, but it had to be adjourned only with the approval of members. So that was, a, was an important point later on. This is a list of those people who were members of the first or second board, I think. And you'll see that there's one from Hong Kong U, or two from Hong Kong U, and two from Chinese U. So you think, oh, good, academics, good stuff, right? Not. Almost at the same time, in 1976, my book was published on Hong Kong rock carvings. Now, I mentioned that because it's relevant to the next bit, which is maybe this was the first mention of any of the AAB in the media, or the first criticism of them. In 1976, they weren't doing anything. They had a provisional antiquities advisory board set up in 74. So I wrote this letter under a pseudonym. They used to accept pseudonyms. I call myself Archaeologo. And um, said, look at what's going on with the rock carvings. They're being vandalized. There's graffiti. People are scratching and painting stuff like I love Mary or their initials over here or something. And so the reply came from a guy who later became a good friend of mine, John Walden. But at that time he was a director of home affairs, so he wrote this kind of silly reply. Then I had a, a longer reply saying, why don't you do something about this, come on. And uh, forget about the $1,000, the, the $5,000 or something, just use a, a, a fence for, to start, for starters. 
Anyway, go forward to 1981. Now, this is six years after the Antiquities Advisory, uh, Antiquities and Monuments Office passed. And I was informed that a new rock carving had been discovered. So I reported this to, to Dr. Bard, who was at that time the head of the AMO. And he told me, well, we know about this. Yeah, sure, and there's no doubt this is a rock carving. I said, mm, I don't think so. It's not. So I wrote in this letter that um, I had consulted Mr. Yim in the geology department, and he and David, uh, uh, David Workman, two geologists, said, mm, we don't think so. We think it's natural. Well, um, there's the carving there at Lung Ha Wan. And I said, um, you really ought to consider this carefully before you go ahead and declare it an erosion feature as an ancient monument, right? Well, the reply came back. I called it cocky. I was going to say smart ass, but I thought, okay, better keep, keep it clean. This is, um, whoops, go back a bit. This is from Brian Wilson, who was at that time director of urban services and chairman of the Antiquities Advisory Board. And he said, for example, they had no doubt about this. They're sure they have no such doubts. And by the way, you think that we should, uh, we should consult the Hong Kong Archaeological Society, but if you mean we should have consulted you, you may be under a misapprehension. We have no such obligation. Six years after it was read in LegCo, or a little bit earlier, saying government should be careful in, well, and then he goes on to make some comment about did I have the authority to write with Hong Kong, the center of Asian studies, because I had signed it like that. It was a kind of a smart ass reply. Anyway, I wrote back, of course, in a similar vein. They went ahead and put it on the cover. This is after my letter, the uh, conversation with the Hong Kong U geologists. They put it on the cover of their uh, annual report, which I thought was just stupid, really stupid. They should have waited, got more. And eventually, five geologists from Wong Kong agreed with Wiss Yim and David Workman that, no, it's probably an erosion feature. Very weird one, but still. OK, the thing that really broke heritage onto the scene was not archaeology, but this. You know what that is, right? Or, any of you remember? Some of you remember this, right? Some of you who are old enough to remember. This was uh, the big fight over preservation of this, this building. And as a result of the government's proposal to demolish it, the Her Hong Kong Heritage Society was set up. And the main players were all from Hong Kong U. Most, most of them were from Hong Kong U. So David Russell, architect, uh, School of Architecture chairman, uh, Peter Hodge, social work, and Nelson Chow, social work, uh, both the vice chairman, I think, and Beth Evans, one of the leading people, also a lawyer uh, in, the, in the School of Law here. So these were some of the leading lights, and the Heritage Society battled to preserve this, this building. But the AAB recommended, they already knew that the government didn't want to save it. So they recommended, well, let's just preserve, we can't preserve the whole thing, right? There's no need. Uh, da, da, da. So they just said, let's preserve the granite pillars and the portico in front, plus the clock tower. That was the AAB's recommendation. Instead of saying, this is a monument, it should be preserved. They went for this sort of compromise. And this amazing statement was brought, was was gotten from Brian Wilson at the Urban Council meeting because he was also director of urban services, which served the Urban Council, those of you who remember the Urban Council. And he, someone asked him, he said, you're supposed to be representing the Urban Council. And the Urban Council does not want this building. So what's your view? And he said, well, my view is that we should get rid of it, the whole thing. Entirely opposed to the recommendation of the AAB. But here's the AAB chairman. You can see how nothing got done if the AAB chairman is actually undercutting any recommendations of the AAB that the government didn't want. Another one. Anybody remember that building? One of the finest buildings in Central, according to most people, and it was hopeless to try to preserve this. We tried. The Heritage Society fought for this, and there's several anecdotes and stories about how we tried and what happened in the CD that you have. Moving on. Another one, Fiasco Murray House. And this one, again, we thought should be preserved, but the government had other ideas. Oh, sorry, wrong way. This is our proposal, marriage society proposal. Put it right there in Chater Garden. There's room for it. It doesn't take up too much open space. Later we said, how about just get rid of that car park over there? Put it over there, right? Um, but no, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. And this is the claim, this is what Mr. Wilson wrote to me. At that time, I was also I was executive secretary for the Heritage Society, 81. 
And he wrote that, well, when it's, when it's going to be developed, the, the area behind it, the piling and foundation work will almost certainly weaken the stability of Murray out. This was a ridiculous claim. Already a bit shaky because of this elevated slip road. And then, so they proposed that it be dismantled and re-erected somewhere else. Now, the Antiquities Advisory Board accepted that without any expert opinion. It's just amazing. Well, here's a summary of the sad story from 76 to 82, when the AAB was first, well, came into, started functioning. All these buildings were lost, Murray Barracks dismantled, supposedly, at the time, intended to be re-erected in Victoria Barracks. Of course, it wasn't. You all know it's in Stanley now, right? It's not quite the same. That's the problem with re-erecting or trying to dismantle and put a building back together again. So this is really a sad, sad tale up to 82. And then you look at what buildings had been declared or what monuments had been declared. There were 19 in total, only two western buildings, Island House and the district office north in Taipo. On Hong Kong Island, which is sort of the center of Hong Kong, 19th century Hong Kong, you had one lousy monument. <laughs> These gas steps and the gas lamps at Dudell Street. No monuments at all in Kowloon. So this was really pathetic, and it was disheartening to everyone, and eventually, of course, the, uh, the Heritage Society gave it up. We, we, everyone thought, well, we can't, we can't win. We're butting our head against a brick wall. It's not going to work. Uh, by 85, there was a little bit of sign that something might change, especially with the governor mentioning heritage in, the, um, in his address. And also, a new chairman was appointed who was a bit more proactive, but he was also very damaging for archaeology. But he was very concerned about historical buildings. That would be Graham Barnes. Um, and then in 86, something very surprising happened. But before we get to that, I wrote this letter. This is my last archaeological letter. And I said, this is just a shame what's going on here. And we have uh, even the, uh, the authority, the Antiquities Advisory Board, um, was given no authority and mandated by law to have these officials. And from those inauspicious beginnings, it has proceeded to go downhill. It was already pretty low. And um, they just didn't fight or give, their, give a great effort to preserve these buildings that were being destroyed one after another. So this is some more from the letter. Um, notice that I mentioned here about these qualities that the members, they didn't speak out. They didn't bring heritage attentions to the public, to heritage issues to the public attention. And the unofficial members, that means the appointed members, not the civil servants, right? They've been, they've, the government has manipulated and dominated the board in the usual civil service ways. The USD, of course, being the main source of information. That's the Antiquities and Monuments Office. Um, and the director of the USD was also the board chairman and the authority to whom the board offers advice. It was a circular kind of arrangement and kind of absurd. Well, that changed. Yeah, there was another letter from one of the members of that board saying we need more democracy in this operation so that the public can have better input. This was written by Chung Wa Nam, an architect on the board. Good guy. Well, in 1986, late 86, I was contacted by the Municipal Services Branch and asked to attend a meeting with Augustine Choi. And he told me he's going to change things. He's going to remove all the civil servants from the AAB, and everybody's going to be appointed, including representatives, although not quite representatives, of these four societies. We found out later, you're not actually representing them. They nominate you, and you'll be appointed ad personum. That means you as an individual, you're not representing them. They just nominate a person, and you will be. And he knew that I was going to be nominated, so he called me in to have a little pep talk. And he said, you know, this is what we want to do. We want a new era of cooperation, spirit of mutual respect, blah, blah, blah. Lots of high-sounding, fine-sounding words, right? Didn't happen. Well, here's the list of the, of the new board. And the chairman was Jason Yoon, an architect. You had uh, Casey Falk still there from Hong Kong U, so, uh, Chung Wan Am, I mentioned. David, uh, Chinese U, Chinese U, and, and the four nominees. David Workman from uh, Hong Kong U, uh, me, honorary person at Hong Kong U, Janet Scott from Baptist College at the time, and a pal of mine, Sally Rodwell, archaeologist, and these two from the Urban and Regional Council. So it was m better in the sense that there's no civil servants there, but it's still a whole bunch of appointed members, plus these two guys representing sort of the, the, the council's interest, 
municipal council. And there they are. There's the chairman, Jason Yu. We had a very rough time dealing with him. K.C. Falk, Chung Wan Am. Mr. Lin, Lin Chao Chen, was an archaeologist. I knew him already. Nice guy. I'll talk about him later as, a, as an example. Dr. Bard over there, David Workman from geology, Janet Scott, uh, David Ford, Chinese Yu, Sally Rodwell, the archaeologist, uh, that guy from uh, Regional Council, David Russell, uh, archaeolo um, uh, architect, a uh, young guy there. Okay. Now, things went well for a little while, for a few months, until this case came up, the synagogue on Robinson Road, Ohelia Synagogue. And this turned out to be one of the, the biggest battle for Hong Kong heritage that we've ever seen. A lot bigger even than the KCR terminus in, uh, in, in Chim Cha Shui. We were told that there were informal discussions taking place by the chairman with the trustees to try to pursue options on how to preserve the building. We said, okay, go ahead, that's, that's good. And occasionally he would report that the, the informal meetings were going along fine, okay? What emerged finally from that was a proposal to build, to dismantle the building, take it down, and build a replica on top of a podium above the street. This is what Lord Kaduri wanted. Lord Kaduri was the chief trustee of the synagogue. Well, this was, the major obstacle they said to preserving the building as it was on the ground was the huge compensation that government would be liable for. This was not a misunderstanding or a mistake or anything else. This was an outright lie, a falsehood, and we found out later. Now, it came about because I, I asked David Russell, who was at that time still at Hong Kong U, and he and Barry Will, another architect, wrote this letter saying that, no, you can develop the rest of the site and leave the synagogue right where it is. Nothing, no compensation should be payable, they said in their letter. Uh, there's several, there's three pages long. I just mentioned here that it's all about development potential and plot ratio and stuff that arch architects deal with. But the conclusion was that no, uh, no, no need to worry. It's um, the maximum development potential down here can be realized. That meant that there's not going to be any compensation payable. If the government preserves that building and they have the whole rest of the site, it's quite a big site, to develop, no compensation payable. Well, this is what we were given on the Antiquities Advisory Board. And the copy's not very good, so I've reproduced it over here. But he said that they had this advice from the Attorney General, and it's as follows, and there's these two indented paragraphs here. He said, not well placed to speculate on the level of compensation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, anyway, as a matter of law, it's the compensation is whatever the district court might decide, okay? And then the next page, well, maybe a lot of people on the board didn't notice this is not part of the indented uh, quote from the attorney general. Anyway, they just threw that in to say that, well, even though resumption is not compensated, look at how much it would cost if it were resumed. And so this figure of $500 million became the talking point on the board. How can we preserve this building that's going to cost 500 or even 300 million? We can't allow, we can't recommend something that's going to cost that much to the government. Well, this was not true, what they said, what they gave us was totally false, and it was made to look that way. Um, after one of the subcommittee meetings, one of the civil servants who was handling the board uh, said, Bill, let's have a lunch. Okay, so we went over to Helena May and had lunch. She put on the table a giant government filing that they opened it up, and she said, they're lying to you. This is a civil servant who was the secretary of the board. I said, what? And she said, they're lying to you. That's not what the attorney general said. And she showed me these five pages of legal advice from the attorney general. And then she said, I've got to go to the loo. Walked away. So of course, I had a look, a quick look. I had, she gave me about 10 minutes. I said, unbelievable. What does the government, what's the attorney general saying? Zero, or near zero compensation. So, I said, it is obvious they are deceiving us on the board. So, I quickly sent out a memo to all the board members and got nine of them to sign, nine out of about, uh, let's say, 14, 15, to sign this appeal calling for the, the authority not to do anything about the synagogue. In other words, it was protected at the moment with temporary monument status. Don't do anything until this is clarified we wrote. And so, okay, th this was like a rebellion on the board. And the, uh, 
the authorities then arranged for us to meet the Crown Solicitor, Jeremy Matthews, at the time. So we had a dinner meeting with Jeremy Matthews, and he explained that how this would work and probably very little compensation or zero. He said they couldn't actually nail it down because it was a highly technical question, but they were sure it wouldn't be more than a few percent, if anything, if, if the trustees even took the government to court to claim compensation. Well, here's what happened. Mr. Lean, my, my, my old buddy at, at Chinese U, the archaeologist, he had said right at the beginning, if the compensation is not a factor, then we should preserve the building. In case he felt, well, he had said, no, no compensation, but there's other issues, and he's sort of flipping around, and finally he decided he voted with government to demolish the building. Mr. Lean, though, when it, when it was finally clear that the compensation would not be a factor, he then said, well, it's a matter of religious freedom. So he just found another reason to vote with the government. And I think why he did that is he felt a bit loyal to the government. Like, they appointed him. They want this. The government wants this. They need this. And it's up to me to go ahead and support them. This is what many appointed members feel, that they're loyal to who appointed them. Right? Well, eventually, I took the government to court. It didn't, didn't work. I'll tell you later. But we got this paper. And I sent this to Amelco, and then I was told that this is probably in contempt of court because this was a paper obtained under discovery or judicial review. But here you, whoops, here you can see he's chastised the uh, Secretary of Municipal Services. And it was Ms. Kingston who gave me, who showed me those legal papers. She was handling this case. See, um, that I'm most concerned your paper extracted only a few general sentences from advice I gave you in three memoranda, right? Totaling 12 pages, right? I think I only saw about seven. Anyway, he said, in the future, unless you provide the board with our full legal advice, any paper which summarizes the advice be referred for clearance by the author of that advice before it's presented to the board. This was like a rebuke. But it was, of course, secret. It was confidential, right? I got this, and then I sent this to Amelco, and they told me, you're in contempt of court. You have to withdraw all these papers, even though their counsel had said, now the papers are here for all the world to see. But he didn't mean to circulate. Only in the courtroom, he said. I pulled them all back, but I kept copies, of course. So after this was exposed, they became rather desperate to obtain the AAB's approval for the replica. So they put forth another lie. And this one was pretty interesting. This is uh, the annex to one of the papers where they're arguing the case. And they said, oh, by the way, in England, in the United Kingdom, which has serious governing uh, policies governing preservation, religious buildings are expressly excluded from antiquities and monuments legislation. How about that? So in England, England does have good heritage protection. So if they would allow it, why wouldn't Hong Kong? And I thought, I don't believe this. So I wrote to English Heritage. I called, I think, and asked, do you have any information on this? Is this true that a synagogue, you know, nearly 100 years old, would that be allowed to be demolished in England? And they said, no, wouldn't. Okay, so he sent me this. Oh, no, here's another. another. This is also, this is Annex 2. And Dr. Bard wrote this code of practice based on a 1979 document. This is already 80, 87. Eh, the board does not look at privately owned non-Chinese places of worship and it felt inappropriate to interfere in matters of religion. Incidentally, in this, the board followed the practice in the United Kingdom, which is kind of odd because I don't think the United Kingdom mentions non-Chinese places of worship. But what he meant, of course, is in the United Kingdom, the religious buildings are excluded from the ordinance. Well, this is what the guy from uh, English Heritage sent me. When is a church not a church? And this is a very typical British solution to the question of, because they were, in fact, exempt from controls in the heritage law. But the question was, OK, does that exemption apply? Is he way, do, 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 do? For the time being, this became the crucial point. And it was debated first in the, the court, then in the high court, and finally, the county council, which was trying to preserve this building, with commendable determination, appeal to the House of Lords. That's the highest body, the law lord, right? And they said, well, when is a church not a church? <laughs> Good question. OK, it's protected. I mean, it's exempt from the controls until it's not a church anymore. And when is that? 
Then they close the doors and call in the bulldozers to knock it down. Then it's not a church. Then it's just a building. So it's, it, is, it is does come under control because it's no longer ecclesiastical in ecclesiastical use. So there's a very interesting legal opinion, but this is the summary of it right here, if, you, if you're interested. That's all in the CD. But this was a peculiar situation where they had exempted ecclesiastical buildings, but they decided that when it's just a shell of a building and no longer used for religious purposes, then it comes under total control just like any other building. That was the situation in England. Uh, well, that led to a second, second rebuke, you could say. He said, um, I'm advised that this inaccurately states the position under English legislation. This was also confidential, not sent to us. And he said, we don't actually advise you, we advise the authority. Um, oh, no, that's the next one. Hang on. Oh, by the way, in Exco, three weeks later, even after that letter was sent to the authority, we still put that in there about... But in England, this would, this would be allowed. Couldn't believe it when I saw this. I'll get to that later, this Exco paper. It's quite interesting. Uh, then I wrote to the legal department. And I said, look, I don't think this is right. English Heritage just told me that it's not right. And he said, well, I'm satisfied that a correct description of the realm law in England was given to him, meaning Secretary for Municipal Services. And notice the way he, he wrote this letter. He didn't say that he's wrong. He just said, we gave him the correct advice. Me implying that he would give us the correct advice, but he didn't. So, and also he didn't, he, did, he was not in a position to tell me what was considered by Omelco, that's Sledgeco in those days. Well, some more deceptions were uncovered, as a matter of fact. Unbelievable. These informal meetings conducted by the AAB chairman with the synagogue trustees were quite the opposite from informal meetings. And the content of these secret meetings didn't contain any idle commercial information that so they needed to be kept confidential. In other words, even the board members didn't know what was going on. Because he said, oh, this is confidential, commercial, business type information. So only the chairman, and he's sworn to secrecy. And, but we discovered when we later got the minutes of all these meetings that there was no exploration at all of any uh, option to preserve the building. Only how to make the replica, what would be involved in it, and how to sell the idea to the AAB and the public. Right. For example, there's one of the minutes of the meeting, the informal meeting. How informal can it be when you've got the Secretary for Municipal Services, one of the trustees, two of the trustees, Swire Properties, Jones Lang Wooten, the architects involved, there's the chairman, Jason Yoon, and others. And these, they had about six of these meetings with minutes and a whole bunch of civil servants and all the people involved in the development. So these were hardly informal meetings between the chairman and the, and the trustees. Well, the final one was the conflict of interest. Oh yeah, I forgot to show you. This is the, this is the famous report of the AAB. And uh, I don't know if any of you ever read this, but it's quite an interesting journal. Uh, Target newsletter published by the, the unbelievably brave Raymond Sacklin. Because I told him I had these papers and he said, I told him about this incident. I told him the whole story. He said, do you have the documents? I said, yes, but I've been told that I would be in contempt of court. He said, I'll publish them. So he was willing to publish them. So he published this little bit about Jason Yoon, the AAB chairman, and his slight conflict of interest. And he wrote this in a very flippant and uh, sarcastic manner, as you'll see from this quote down here. No question that Mr. Yoon wants this commission, that is, commission to build a replica because he had studied in Israel, because he's an architect. The conflict of interest was he had a Lord Kaduri scholarship to study in England. And he's dealing with Lord Kaduri and the chief trustee. And then up here he said, oops, Mr. Unism is a man of high principles, but an even higher standard of living, <laughs> meaning he needs that commission. So this was, of course, later. And then one of these authoritative proclamations about this so-called, the, the, the issue of conflict of interest about the scholarship. He didn't actually call it his right name. He said, your association with the Sir Ellis Kaduri College Alumni Association, what that was was a Lawrence Kaduri scholarship that he obtained to go and study in England. Wait, the, 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 the authority said, I give this ruling that it's not a conflict of interest. 
And he didn't have any right to do that because in the AAB's own rules, it was supposed to be the AAB members that decided what was a conflict of interest and what was not. So he tried to push the board on to think about that. Hey, nothing, nothing to see here. Well, here's the, the famous Exco paper, also given to me by someone after I lost the court case. There it is. You don't see one of them very often, though, the confidential, highly confidential Exco paper. Notice, though, that uh, when the person gave it to me, she cut out those, those codes on each side because that would identify whose copy it was. Each, one, each person who got it had a different code. So she cut that out. But this thing, to pardon, to pardon my French, it's just full of crap. Just full of crap. Unbelievable. I'll show you. <laughs> For example, the, uh, oops, let's go back to that, right? Okay. The uh, a member of the AAB then started lobbying members with a view to overturning the decision, blah, 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 uh, mishandling, misleading the board. Feeling, this resulted in a number of ABs feeling uncertain, AB members feeling uncertain. I thought, oh, the poor dears. Actually, that wasn't the case. They were very angry at being misled. Uh, in the meantime, the members' comments and accusations in the press, unauthorized by AB, right? This member who was spreading this stuff. The, uh, the uh, where did he say that? Uh, uh, anyway, you can read it all yourself. But it's all about, it's all untrue what was written here about the, the reaction of the AAB members. It wasn't that they felt uncertain. Oh, yeah, distrustful speculation was also spread by this member who described blah, blah, blah. Well, Eventually, I decided this is a case for judicial review. It should go to the courts. Worst decision that I ever made, I think, in my life, and I made some pretty bad ones. This one cost me a lot of money, even though I had two other backers, members of the, of the synagogue who wanted to preserve the building. We didn't even get to court. Why? Don't take on the government by yourself unless you've got a lot of money, right? And especially if some other big players are involved, like Lord Kaduri the trusting one of the powerful men in Hong Kong, or, say, Swire Properties, right? Because guess what? They had joined the action. I was prepared to take on government. We had $100,000 raised from the public, about $50,000 from my solicitor. He said $50,000 would cover government. Okay, we're fine. And then the trustees adjoined the action. I said, can they do that? He said, well, yeah. they got out this giant white book. They have a right to be heard. And then Swire Properties, so we had to withdraw. Cost a lot of money. We lost the war. I mean, we lost every battle that we fought, and yet the war was won by the grace of God, or Yahweh. But the synagogue was preserved. It's still there today. But they sacrificed this wonderful site all around it, and they put up these giant high-rises. So that had a happy ending, finally. And then we had a little celebration when it was preserved. And these are some of the main players who, it wasn't just me or a few members of the board. Tony Collar, a geologist and a surveyor, me, Alan Goldstein and Andrea Thame, members of the Jewish community, and uh, Sammy Benchai and uh, Dick Hoffman, Lam Kwai Fong guy, they were all members of this group of, of uh, synagogue members called SOS, Save Our Synagogue. Sally Rodwell, the archaeologist, Ann Kingston, the civil servant who risked her career and actually lost her job by giving me this leak about the... the um, the compensation, and Carl Smith, member of the, Reverend Carl Smith, member of the board. So this was a great day. We, we, we had finally, even though we lost all the battles that we fought, we say the building was saved. And of course, the Hong Kong government was very appreciative of my efforts to save this building and our efforts. Guess what happened? When the next round of nominations came up, they, first they, we, we heard that they're not going to not ask the society to nominate. And then say, oh, yes, we, we are going to invite you. We're now writing formally to invite your society to put forward a nomination. What's the key word here? Can you read that? <laughs> two. Give us two names, and we'll appoint one of them. So, of course, they nominated me, chairman, and another guy, and they appointed the other guy, of course. Well... This got some publicity, too, because this was obviously another manipulation of the board to get the people on it that weren't so violent or so uh, spreading distrustful speculation, like I did, according to Exco. 
And this guy who used to write a very interesting article called State of the Nation, James Nation, he, he called the governor a skillful rigor. And he said, to remove the embarrassingly disputatious William Meacham from membership. Well, it happened, and there's nothing you could really do about it. The other societies went along. And then I, I, we took this to LegCo, thinking, OK, if we, it failed in the, in the court. We couldn't get it to court. But LegCo at least should investigate some of these really atrocious deceptions that were practiced upon us. And they came back with a complete whitewash. And this is not 1970s. This is 1988 or 89. Whitewash, the whole thing. Couldn't believe it when I saw that. And there are the people who signed it. They're all members of the board, plus, um, plus David Workman, who was on one of the AAB subcommittees. But those are all members of the board who voted to save the building. And the vote was 7 to 6. But in the Exco paper, they said it was 6 to 6. So even, that, even the vote was not correct in the Exco paper. Well, I, then I took it to the ombudsman after this whitewash of, of Lechko's investigation. I took it to the ombudsman and uh, had a few points in there about the AAB. Some of the other stuff was just about the authority and the trustees. But the Antiquities Advisory were misled concerning the declaration, the planning, repeatedly and deliberately deceived on points of fact. Chairman's possible conflict of interest. The authority breached the board's self-defined procedures, et cetera, et cetera. Ten, ten points for the ombudsman. And he produced a really thorough investigation. It took a year. And here it is. I mean, that's an investigation. 149 pages plus appendices. Right? And what did he find? Well, he found four points substantiated and two points partially substantiated. And he rejected the terms that I had used, which was collusion and manipulation. He called them procedural errors. This is sort of a nice way of saying you really screwed up. You're bad. But this was a serious case of maladministration. This is what the ombudsman is supposed to investigate, maladministration. So what did the government do about this serious case of maladministration? Well, they gave him a CBE right after that, just two months later. Unbelievable. What? OK, CBE, just after this four counts of maladministration and another two counts partially substantiated, they got to reward their loyal civil service, you know, even ignoring all the blatant deceptions, all their dirty tricks, even when they're proved, even when it caused an open rebellion on the AAB. But that's not all. They also gave him a plum retirement appointment as head of the Civil Service Commission, Public Services Commission. High salary, two, two days a week of work, $100,000 or something. Unbelievable. So John Walden, by that time, retired and turning against the government, sort of. He said, this is unbelievable. So they, they interviewed him about this appointment. And there was a big flap about that. But nothing, nothing, nothing happened. Well, back to the AAB and uh, its handling of archaeology. I just wanted to show you this one. This is not, this is not so long ago that the society was trying to get a subvention to have full-time staff. And we made several requests to the, to the AAB to make a submission and, and to LegCo. And we went to the LegCo on four different occasions to present the case, but never to the AAB, never once invited to the AAB. And this is their sort of attitude. This is a new chairman now, Edward Ho, Ho Sing Team. Everybody knows him, I think. He said, well, you know, the, uh, the subcommittee dealing with archaeology, uh, its role is to advise the board on archaeological issues rather than to serve as a forum for local archaeological groups. So they don't want, they don't want to know from you. And the only archaeological group in Hong Kong was the Hong Kong Archaeological Society. In other words, they wanted to pick and choose who they put on this board. Thank you, anyway, for all your good work. And the chairman of this archaeology subcommittee was from Hong Kong U, an academic. And this is what he wrote to me. And I just, I, I was going to write a very nasty letter. I said, oh, what's the use? Because I said, look, the, 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 the office, the antiquities office is really failing to monitor archaeological sites that are being destroyed. And I, had some, I wanted to present some information to his subcommittee on archaeology. And this is what he told me. Your views are very well known from the media. He's an academic. He's relying on the media. Well, here's another case, Ngachin Wai, the last of the old villages in Kowloon, right, in, in what they call New Kowloon. There's plenty of them in the New Territories, but one by one in, in Kowloon, the old indigenous villages were being destroyed. 
And they decided they're going to develop this one too. And the case was taken up by Patrick Hayes, a friend of mine who was a local historian. There he is, fighting this case. He called it a priceless village, the last one, and how can they not preserve it? And uh, another case where they had some, someone from Chung Kong present at the meeting, but not Dr. Hayes or the district council of Hugo Lam or the village head. None of them were invited, but Chung Kong was there because they wanted to develop it. And the AAB said, oh, there's many of these houses are dilapidated. The only building saving, worth saving is the little Teen Hao Temple. So forget about it. Go ahead, demolish the whole rest of the village. Well, the SCMP got in on this. The Morning Post said, the only purpose of having such a body is to identify and protect archaeological and historical treasures of the past. And the government hasn't shown much interest. And why it's up to those who are picked for the purpose. If not, perhaps it is the AAB that is not worth preserving. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's really true. Here's another case. Anybody recognize that building, Peking Road, in the old days? This is called the Old Market Building on Peking Road. And we thought this building was going to be preserved because right next to it here, well, the whole thing was converted to a parking shop with the Watsons in that and parking shop over here. Well, great. It's a, it was an old mar wet market, and now it's a parking shop. Good. But they wanted it. They wanted to take it away. So they said, and this is now, now there's a new chairman, David Lung, who, by the way, was a founding member of the Heritage Society, like me, sort of went over to the government side. And now he's chairman of the AAB. So I called him, and this is what he told me. He said they were offered a choice, the AAB, between the police station hill, which is back there, or this building, which sat right at the base of the hill on Peking Road. And later on the TV show, he said the, the, the Antiquities and Monuments Office is not fighting for this, and it's a Mickey Mouse department. They need more staff. They really didn't need. It's the only time that David Long really criticized the government when they were giving him this deal. Most of the time he went along. Well, that was the price. And they pulled down that building and they put up this giant office building, Peking One or Number One Peking Road or something. It's, well, that's there now. And everyone thought, okay, that's the price for preserving Team Chacho Hill and the Marine Police Department, Marine Police Station on top of the hill. That's the station right there. That's the way, to, the way it looked in 1908. The station's way back in the background. You can just see it there. And that signal tower here. So everyone thought, until one day, it's announced that it's going to be preserved. Well, it's going to be preserved. Only that building is going to be preserved. The AAB had not declared the whole site, the hill, the, the signal tower, and all the trees on the hill to be preserved. Only the building. So what happened? They decided, let's, let's just get rid of all that, right? Got rid of all that. Well, kept, kept the signal tower. That, that, that's part of them. That was a monument, I think, by itself. And a few mature trees. So they kept about three in little nail houses, like you know, they call it in China, nail trees. Right? They kept about four, I think, plus some down on the road. And that's what you got today. Instead of the hill and that very pleasant, uh, this is called, ironically, 1881 heritage. <laughs> a disgrace, an absolute disgrace. Well, here's a later one. Come, getting close to the present now, most of you can remember this, right? When the Star Ferry came down? Star Ferry first in 2006, and there was sit-ins. And I thought, this is great. But I think Arthur Lee, your council president, chairman, would have probably called it mob rule. But it was actually a peaceful sit-in, peaceful disobedience. Or, but they were protesting the demolition of, of all things, the Star Ferry clock tower which is not that old. It just meant something to people. And when that one went, then they protested the Queen's Pier. And this was youth and young people and students and activists. So this woke the government up to the fact that, you know, people care now. It's not like the old days when only a few people go, oh, there's just an expat, just a guaylo, you know, and a few other Chinese, but most people don't care. We put wrong, by the way, in 1979, the KCR, we set up a table outside and collected petitions. And 90% of the people who signed were Chinese, and almost all of them said, yes, keep that building. And also the club. We did the same thing for the Hong Kong club. But anyway, this, this shook government because when people go out and protest like that, they have to get concerned. But again, the AAB flubbed it completely. There's a very interesting study of that whole episode, also very lengthy, uh, as a thesis that was done here by uh, Kim Wah Chai, and you can read this 
it's pretty verbose and a lot of uh, jargon in it because it was, of course, for a master's at Hong Kong U, so there has to be a lot of academic jargon in it, but you can get the story, and it's quite an interesting story of how the AAB totally missed it. Even though the consultant that they hired to review the, any impact, any heritage impact on this whole, um, what do they call it, the Central Bypass Expressway, he warned about this. He said, you better keep that, that tower, at least, or the Star Ferry Terminal because, or pier because people might react, and they ignored it. Uh, she wrote in this thesis, as a kind of conclusion, she said, these serial rejections by the government and its agencies buttress the impression of arrogant officialdom dismissing citizens' preferences out of hand. And this is what David Russell wrote, reflecting on the Heritage Society, uh, which existed from 78 to 84, the incredible arrogant attitudes of some administrators. So, you know, this is not much changed between the 70s and 80s, and 2006 or 7. Not much change. People will ask me, what's going to happen after 97 in Hong Kong? Probably not much. Lots the same. I wrote an op-ed in 2004, before, just before the thing, saying maybe the AAB should just be abandoned, demol abolished, demolish it, because it's not doing any good. And these are some of the comments that I made about how the, the way it operated is seriously flawed. This is after the civil servants have been removed on, as members, right? Um, they appoint these yes men, a lot of them, uh, the appointed members, a lot of them become yes men, or they develop this mentality. They, even some of them admit that they're rubber stamps, and they hold the meetings behind closed doors, and officials maintain that this enables members to speak their minds freely, but I don't think so. In fact, those two cases that I mentioned earlier from Hong Kong U and Chinese U, I think if those meetings were open to the public and published, I don't think they would have voted with the government. But because it was closed and private, they sort of felt, well, oh, I better go along with government. Plus, they thought it might be good for their career. So I think that idea of confidentiality really does not work. What it develops is go along, give the government what it wants, and see, what, see if they'll appoint me to another post, another position. Well. Things have improved since then, somewhat. This is the web page of the AAB. By the way, they only adopted this web page, which is their own. They were under the LCSD until I made a big fuss about the way they published something on their minutes. I said, look, this is a government LCSD website. You're responsible for the content. The AAB should have their own web page. Well, a few months later, lo and behold, they, they did have one. And they welcome public submissions and public comment, etc. So, here's some changes that have improved. They do publish the agenda in advance now for the public. The meetings are open, mostly. There's an occasional closed door session when something confidential has to be discussed. The chairman regularly briefs the media, which is good. The minutes are published later to, for the public, which is good. And most recently, the members' names are actually given in the minutes for what they say. What? They weren't? I'll show you the case. Oh yeah, but <laughs> a lot of the same old flaws remain. Like all 24 now members are appointed. No representation from any community organization. Resistance to any expert or concern group giving them a hearing, even hearing from them. Oh, you can submit it in writing. The members are, the, the meetings are attended by an army of civil servants, sometimes outnumbering the AAB members that are present. They still rely very heavily on civil servants to explain things. And submissions are often ignored or brushed aside. I'll give you an example of that in a minute. And it's extremely difficult to contact these members. They don't publish their names, addresses, emails, fox, nothing. And when you send them something, they almost never respond. In fact, I've written to them a number of times over the years, and I think I've gotten two responses out of, you know, 20 members since 2007, A, hardly ever respond to you. Even though now we have email, before we had fax, it wouldn't be difficult to acknowledge and say, I'll look at it, right? For example, LegCo, they publish websites, email addresses, sometimes their office phone numbers. So why can't AAB do that? But they recently rejected this suggestion. Um, maybe they'll consider that eventually if I put some pressure on them, or somebody does. This is an example from one of the meetings about 20, 2014 or 2013. You see the army of civil servants in attendance at this meeting, right? And this was, in this case, there were 17 AAB members and 16 civil servants, plus one taking the minutes. So this is the way government controls. Even though the chairman at that time was uh, Edward Ho, he said, oh no, they don't have a vote. 
No, no, they're all there. They're all, they're all listening. They can comment. They can, they can explain things. Right? Well, to give you an example, in 2008, I noticed that the, the rock climbing at Potoi was, was seriously threatened with a, uh oh seriously threatened with a, a mole or fungus that was actually peeling off the surface of the rock. Excuse me. So I wrote to the AAB saying, look, I will show you, I need to show you some of the slides and explain what's going on, because it was a very fine film, black film of mold. And it, as it dried out, it peeled away. And on the underside, you could see tiny little bits of the rock. It was actually peeling the surface. So what did they do? They got somebody to explain. They got Isa, who was the head of the Antiquities and Monuments office. She said, yeah, okay, she'll explain so along this explanation. And then she also referred to my proposal to form a consultancy with various professionals, but it's more appropriate for the staff of the conservation section, being in a neutral position to handle the restoration of the rock army. Well, they weren't in a neutral position because, one, they missed it. Number two, they treated it with some chemicals that they should not have done. So they were going to basically... Uh, I want to say cover their ass, you know that expression? They would, they would be there to say, well, we didn't do anything wrong, and we do monitor it. So that was an entirely silly proposal of hers to, that they are neutral in this. But the whole question, why is she giving this explanation to them? Why am not I giving this explanation? Because remember, I wrote the first book on the rock carving way back in 76. This is 2008. Here's another instance. Um, I wrote them about how this consultancy study was being done. And I was on it, one of the four consultants. Uh, and then they, they referred to my letter, and then they got Chan, Chan, Chan Sing Wai, who was head of the conservation unit, to explain things. Like, this is how it's being organized. It's, it's okay, you know. The, the, and uh, the studies be completed, and blah, 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 blah. Right. Here's some of the notes from that discussion afterwards. And this is a, a particularly galling to me. You see, members, some member, a member, not names, just a member. Well, a member strongly objected to Mr. Meacham's letter, given that he is a consultant hired for the study. He has a contractual obligation to abide by the requirements. Well, I wasn't challenging the, ob challenging the requirements. I was saying you, it, there's another way you could do it that's better. And also, something's not in the co contract that they're doing. But instead of hearing from me, they chose to hear from the head of the, the guy who's organizing this, this study. So again, another example, right? How many more do you, do you need? This one, for example. And some of the people at the Architectural Conservation Program were involved in this case. They were hired as consultants, and they gave this Hotel Gardens a higher rating than King Yin Lake, which was, is that what King, King Yin, King Yin Lake? They gave this one a higher rating in terms of cultural heritage value. That one got served, this one did not. Well, why? The AB meeting he accepted that Exco decided this building would not be declared. Therefore, nothing more could be done. That's what happened. So I was really interested in this case. So I sent them an urgent submission that possibly a synagogue-type solution would save, could be used to save this site. They refused to hear from me. Instead, they invited the AMO, the head of the AMO, to explain why it would not work. Then I sent a second submission saying this site could be resumed without costing anything out of present government coffers. Chairman refused to invite me to the meeting, and they never even considered that proposal. Here you go. I'd, made this pres I'd asked to make this presentation to the AB meeting, and then they, 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 they invited Tom Ming to, brief account, to give a brief account on the synagogue case. He wasn't even aware of the synagogue case at the time. And he explained how the synagogue case didn't apply, but he got it wrong. He went on and on about some details that weren't applicable. He gave his long explanation, missed the point entirely. And then there's a long discussion in which seven members chimed in, and each one is minuted there. And I thought, God, this probably took more time than my actual presentation for them to decide not to hear from me. Right? And so it went. The building went because of A, B, without a whimper, without a bang, just a whimper. Not even a whimper. They just, well, A is gone. XO decided. That's it. So I wrote another letter today to the Morning Post. This is now getting pretty close to the present, saying they didn't even try. Well, these days they usually don't answer letters. They just ignore them, right? To conclude, 703. Good. My own experience is that the system is intrinsically flawed. 
It encourages cronyism, fosters opportunists, eager to curry favor with senior government officials. From the, and I went to the district council on this Hotung uh, Ho Gardens case. I can, that's in the book, in the e-book. You can read all about that. That was really disgusting. As disgusting as the AAB. They gave me three minutes. But you get a lot of this boot-licking, shoe-shining uh, among these members right up to the executive council. Oops. And you can see some of the quotes from that Exco paper about how that happens. So you can reel off the names of these successful yes men who've risen up through the ranks, and even well-meaning individuals like Mr. Lin Shoqin at Chinese U. A nice guy, a meaningful, you know, a well meant well, but he sort of got sucked into this and pressured by the government. He yielded. Right? Instead of fighting, they just wind up generally subservient. And not too long ago, some civil senior civil servant claimed in regard to the another advisory board that individual appointees could be more objective than those from organizations because they, don't, they can operate more rationally without pressure from their organization. So that's their justification, plus this idea of keeping it confidential so they can speak freely. This is just not the case as far as I'm concerned, in my, my experience of about 30 years. To conclude, oh, that, that is the conclusion. This is still available. Everybody's got a free copy, but it's still copyright. So if you have anyone who wants to, to have a copy, ask them to contact me. And it's very cheap, 20 bucks. Someone said, is that US dollars? No, that's Hong Kong dollars. <laughs> Thank you very much. There you go, you got to stay through the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, it is, uh, I think my microphone is pissed off, but it doesn't really matter. Um, it, is, it is really great to hear such a passionate, uh, I think you believe in what you were saying, Bill. Um, so I'm sure you've got a lot of questions. Um, I'm going to, first of all, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to propose, propose a sort of formal vote of thanks and then I'm going to leave, but then I hope you will stay behind and ask questions either in a formal setting or if the situation arises just in a small group chatting. Um, so, Bill, I mean, I was fascinated. I, I, I moved there so I could see the screen because I... My eyes are not good enough to see that screen. But I really enjoyed, and I'm sure we all really enjoyed your from the heart presentation. It must have caused you a lot of pain over many years. And money. Yeah, I mean, I know you're only 35 now, and look what it's done to you. I mean, it's, it's yeah. much, uh... <laughs> so, right here. so thank you so much for coming, and thank you for your presentation, and thank you in advance for interacting with our questions. Pleasure. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. OK. Well, discussion, questions, disputations? There's a lot of data in that, uh, in that e-book. So you've got uh, 310 pages of documents. Yeah. 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 Um, thanks for that very depressing talk. <clears throat> I'm now a member of a similar board, pretty strict confidentiality requirements and lots of government appointees and a chairman who's a little bit autocratic perhaps. Yes. Given all your years of experience on that kind of board, do you have any advice other than giving us this litany of <laughs> terrible outcomes? <laughs> well, I think the thing you can really do is try to get to the appointed members since they're there, right? You can't, until you can get some change where it's mostly elected. If they were elected from organizations, you could try to lobby the organization. Since you've got these appointed members, I think the only thing you can do is try to put as much uh, pressure and information and uh, public focus on them as you can. Because they're getting that in the corridors of power from government. That's what happens to appointed members. They're called aside, discussed privately, or sometimes publicly to get pressure, or from the newspapers, like a wind wave owl, for example. So you just have to counteract that. That's the only thing I can say. And in this case, in the case of the synagogue, it did finally work. We did get a vote of, of seven to six in favor of retaining that as a monument status. Right? But that took some, some doing, because some of them were wavering. They wanted to abstain. They said, Look, if you abstain, it's going to pass. The, the, they're going to revoke the monument status, and the building will come down if you abstain. You can't just abstain. You have to come make a decision. So we did manage in that, in that case. 
Sometimes it doesn't work, right? But that's, that's the only thing I can think of, uh, other than public shaming. <laughs> Any other question, comment? If you could, if you could clear the board, maybe literally, uh, and start again, is there another structure that would work better? Another model that we could use that would cut through all this bureaucracy and get the right people in the right place to actually discuss heritage? Because my understanding of the board is only a few members are actually trained professionals in the heritage field, yeah. and that others are taken from other oh, walks of life, and um, they can't really contribute professionally to right. a discussion. Right. If you could start again and restructure it, how do you think you could proceed? Well, they had, what they had at the beginning, well, not at the beginning, but when I, when I went on the board, they had two subcommittees, and one was for archaeology and one was for historical buildings. So that's, that's sort of a good model. That could work, you know, even to have two boards, statutory boards, where you have archaeologists in one group and architects and surveyors and uh, historians in another group dealing with historical buildings and keep it to those two professional bodies. Because this is what decides serious matters in the legal profession, the medical profession, dentistry, all those professional bodies, right? They make decisions, they govern themselves, right? Well, there's only eight, eight or 10 archeologists and there's a very few local historians, but plenty of architects, right? So you could get, assemble a group of people with direct relatives, right? That's the way, if you could start from scratch all over, back in 1976, and you have an antiquities advisory board with two bodies that decide things. And, and well, it's still advisory, so they, they make recommendations that the government would want to follow. So that's the only thing I can think of that would, you know, that would be a different model that would work. Plus, maybe something like English Heritage, private foundation, but that takes a lot of money. You know? And it could have actually happened if they had set it up properly. And said, what they did, they, they set up the Lord Wilson Heritage Trust which is just, to me, unbelievable, because he never did anything for heritage. In fact, he let this synagogue go, and he let other buildings go. He was really pretty much hopeless in, in heritage. And then they set up a heritage trust in his name. But if they had instead set up a Hong Kong heritage trust and invited billionaires and billionaires to contribute to it, that would have been something. Some of these properties could be bought. Hotel Villa, they said, was going to cost five or six billion dollars. So that would have been beyond the reach even of English heritage. You're talking about big money here, a building like that. But there was a way to preserve it using resumption that would not have cost the government one penny of government funds. It's in the, it's in the ebook. If you want me to give you a, a, nut, in a nutshell, they offered that woman, an old woman who owned that Hotong Villa and Gardens. She owned it outright. She inherited it from Hotong, Robert Hotong. They offered her a parcel of land right beside it that she could develop the townhouses that she wanted. She refused. She said, I'm attached to this property, but not the buildings, just the property. She's attached to it. And she wanted to live in one of the townhouses. And she refused down the line. Even Carrie Lamb tried to talk to her and, and couldn't persuade her. And then when it was finally de not declared a monument, she sold it and not living there at all, sold it to a Chinese uh, millionaire. The way it could have been preserved was that piece of land that they offered her, which is in Greenbelt or something, never would have been sold. They could have sold it and bought the land from her or paid her the resumption cost. So not a penny out of current government coffers. And I put that to the district council and they voted it down 14 to 5 because there were 14 members of the DAB and so-called independents and only five non-independent for pro-democracy people on the district, central and western district council. So it's hard, even a solution that would work, I couldn't even present it to the Antiquities Advisory Board. They wouldn't even hear from me. Yes, Joyce. Hi, Bill. Um, you mentioned that the, the AAB has improved its transparency somewhat over the years. Um, I wonder if you have observed any improvement in um, information about heritage in Hong Kong outside of what is presented to the A because um, as a journalist covering heritage issues, I find it extremely difficult to obtain information from the government before it's presented to the AAB. Uh, for example, in the case of the HMS Tamer uh, wreckage, it was discovered some months before the government made an announcement. Um, but then before I interviewed Professor 
Stephen Davis of this university, the government didn't say anything hinting that it could be HMS Tamer, uh, while it actually had information months ago. And uh, when the government replied my question, they said, oh, we don't know yet what it is. And then a day after the interview was published, they released a press statement saying, oh, it may be HMS Tamer. So I don't know what can be done, or is it already better than the days when you were on the AAB? Well, again, you, uh, they, what they want to do, obviously, is decide what they're going to do first before they release any information publicly, something sensitive like that. So they, they're thinking about it, they're consulting interdepartmentally, and then they're going to put it to the AB, and the AB, that may be a closed session. So it's, the press is not allowed to, to sit in or to listen to those if they want to keep it secret, right? So that's the way they do it. But the only option is to ferret out the information, like, like you did in that case. Find out who knows. You know, if you hear something, then follow up with who might know, right? That's the only thing I can think of that, that, that can work to get this information out first. Because the government tends to like to have things in a nice package. You know, something suddenly comes up, they like to just have it in the package first and then present it to you, the press, and the AAB. And this is what, and very rarely will they change that, that package. There's one example that I cited in the book, which is, uh, I'm sure you, you know very well, which is this one. That one was sort of uncontrollable. This uh, Song Dynasty site that was found at the Tokawan Station. Everybody know about that? Huh? Well, this is what they would have got if they had the panel of archaeologists. Can you read that? MTR relics not worth the fuss, archaeologists. And that was not only me, it was Tang Chung at Chinese University. So two of the most experienced, arche the, the most experienced archaeologists in Hong Kong said, not worth $3.2 billion. Not million, billion dollars. Just insane, just insane. And this was kind of their own, uh, as they say, hoist of their own petard, as they say in English, because they didn't. They relied on the AAB, the AAB's pressured by the, by the public, not going to the professionals to say, is this really worth that much? How much should we spend on this, and how much is it worth, right? It's an ordinary Sung Dynasty village site. It's not Sung Wong Toy, it's not. At least there's no evidence at all that it's Sung Wong Toy. If it was Sung Wong Toy, 3.2 billion is okay for it, obviously, if you had some strong evidence. So, the only thing I can say is, you know, just keep digging. As an archaeologist, that's what we do, right? As a journalist, that's what you do. You just got to dig for the information. Any other question or comment? All that legal stuff? Yes. Why is it seems as the Hong Kong government does not lack money, but why is it so reluctant to preserve historical sites and buildings? From your perspective, what are the reasons? Well, I mean, usually it is the high cost. I mean, Ho Chung Gardens was ultimately sold for seven billion dollars. So they were obviously resisting for something else. They say that they don't want to get involved in lengthy litigation that might cost a lot of money, plus the compensation that will be paid, plus they respect owners rights. Ultimately, this is the, the final line that they use for the synagogue as well, okay, even in England the situation is like that, okay, but ultimately it's a plot of land with no restriction. Sold at auction, 1899, or whenever the synagogue trustees set it up, 1902 I think it was. Robert Hotung was probably around the same time. So an unrestricted lease of that land to be developed is going to generate seven billion dollars, right? So what could they do? They couldn't justify spending seven billion on to preserve that site, right? But they did offer a piece of land, and that piece of land that they offered is worth seven billion dollars. Or actually, they didn't want to, to preserve the whole site. Part of the site could be developed, and this parcel that they offered was going to replace the part that's going to be preserved, right? So that was a neat solution that wouldn't have cost anything from the present coffers because it's just a piece of land, right? But they didn't want to sell the land and then pay the resumption. They didn't want to resume it. And when I went to the Central Western District Council, someone from the Development Bureau said, well, we've never tried this resumption before. We haven't used that. And I said, well, why not? And they said, well, it, it needs investigation. Something has to go through Exco. They gave several reasons why they couldn't do that or why they didn't want to do that. 
but they do have the right to resume. Someone else on the city, on that district council said, well, you can't just go away taking away people's property development rights. And someone else answered, they do it all the time. They resume land all the time for a public purpose. Right? So resumption is another way. But then you have to consider that how much it's going to cost. If it's in the billions, then the government might not be willing to pay that much in resumption. Right? Unless there's a piece of land nearby that they can offer as a swap. And that's what did work for King Yin Lei. Right? He did accept, the owner did accept that land. So for other buildings that are not in the billions of dollars, sometimes it's just lethargy. They just don't want to, to go against the owner of that building, private ownership. They don't want to go through the litigation. But it's naturally never been tested in court. And another thing that I wanted to present to, to the council, of, I mean to the AAB, at that meeting where they discussed whether or not to land, I had an opinion three pages long from Henry Lytton. You know who he is, right? Everybody should know that from law school. He's on the court of final appeal as an adjunct justice or something. He wrote me a three-page opinion in the synagogue case while that was brewing, saying he didn't think that the compensation is automatic, that it's optional. The government may pay compensation, not shall. Right? So I tried to present that opinion to the AB, and they, 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 didn't, they didn't even see it. They didn't, they, didn't, they didn't want to see it. So it's very hard to get through. Government has its own procedures and ways, and it sort of depends on who thinks what. For example, why is the Supreme Court building now in Central? Why did it never come up for development? Why? Because the director of public affairs at the time, David McDonough, liked the building. So he, he made sure nothing, nothing happened to that building. He didn't like the Hong Kong Club, so it went. And he was a member of the Hong Kong Club and on the development panel. <laughs> Any other question? Comment? Sure. Norbert. My question may be a, a bit removed from the substantive focus of your talk. Um, I'm trying to uh, compare the strategic options available to policy challenges back in the 70s and 80s versus those uh, available to challenges uh, to government policy nowadays. Is there any um, major change given the, the transition in political and uh, societal uh, conditions? Uh, where are, are new options becoming more available to those who, who do not uh, agree with the government uh, policy, say, uh, regarding conservation or other, other uh, uh, areas? You mean just ordinary members of the public? Uh, or, or the organized uh, interests or organized uh, people who, who like to, uh, do, to, to, to challenge uh, certain policy of government. No, it's hard. No? It's hard because I had the Exco paper, right? I had a paper. And I wrote to the Exco members. I wrote to two of them, Maria Tam and president of Baptist College. I forget his name now. He was on Ex Exco Council. I thought at least that guy, I can't remember his name. But the president of Baptist College, and I said to those two, I wrote, and I said, look, they're lying to you. There's a whole bunch of nonsense in that Exco paper. And you know what they replied? Nothing. And this was when there was the Office of Members of the Executive and Legislative Council called OMELCO. So I submitted that to that same submission to OMELCO. And I said, look, it's for the Exco member, because there's several things in here that are wrong, that are false. And you know what they said? Can't discuss it. Exco paper is confidential. So you can't get into those highly restricted areas, right? They just won't, they just won't respond, right? The only hope is going to LegCo, taking it to uh, the booty panel or some LegCo members and have them investigate, right? Which is what we did way back in, let's see, when was it? In the late 70s, we took an archaeological case to LegCo and they took it up with a panel and investigated and found actually partially substantiated our claim. Whereas when the pressure was really on in the synagogue case in 1988, they whitewashed it. Right? I couldn't believe it. And even when it was pointed out to them that they were lied to, they didn't care. I think I have that in the, I have that in the CD. The letter from the Ekumer. They conducted a complete, objective, and rational investigation, and they found nothing wrong. Right? And then it was, it was so clear and proven that they were misled. So it's really hard to get at 
the, 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 the core of the policy. Even when you have somebody like Selena Chow giving a speech in mid-1987 mid saying, why can't Hong Kong preserve buildings? Singapore has, and Singapore is doing a good job. Why can't Hong Kong do it? We wrote to her, didn't reply. We shamed her in public, in the press, no comment. So that's all you can do that I can think of, right? Petition our elected legislators, or even the appointed ones. Hire some, you know, people that have access to power and try to bend them or persuade them. I remember in some of the cases earlier in the 70s, uh, the chairs actually wrote to Exco members, in, uh, apart from law, lawmakers, also petitioning directly to the governor and uh, members of Exco. So is that strategy still uh, relevant or appropriate uh, nowadays? Well, it might work, especially if it's, if it's in the statute. Like, I was denied a license once for archaeological research, archaeological ex excavation, and it is in the license. It's a statutory process to appeal to the governor. So I did. I appealed to the governor. And everyone said it was hopeless, Ho absolutely hopeless, because all the officials, you know, back up this refusal of the license because they had a new policy, and they didn't want any more piecemeal approach, right? It's impossible. Well, I mounted a big campaign in the press, and at that time, McLehose was the governor. And when it came to his desk, he wrote a memo that shocked everyone. He said, I, you, you better look into this. Maybe it's just a clash of personalities here. And so that fit them all scurrying, all the civil servants wondering, what, what do we do? So they set up a, a small panel of, of, I think it was five people, to decide this case. And the vote was three to two in my favor. So I got this letter, short letter, saying, your petition has been allowed. I said, what, what? He approved. So that worked. But that was, you know, extremely rare that that can ever happen. But it's worth a try if there's a statutory avenue. Otherwise, you send in a submission. You know, if it's, if it's not part of the statute, you can try that and build up some press pressure. Press pressure, right? That might work, too. Any other comment, question? Yes. Sure. If we had a conservation policy, this is something that's been floated around a lot in the sort of attempts at defining that, but a clear-cut policy from central government, I'll call it, towards conservation, um, would that give a foundation to form a board or a, an organization that would really come up with the goods? Or is it because it's a vague notion, and that's why you get a vague system that ends up in a very gray zone that you've just described. It's very hard to get through. Yeah, they always, they always allow some gray mm. in, the, you know, in the policies. Like, they have a policy now, and they're always saying, oh, we need a policy review. I mean, since I, in my memory, I can remember at least four times that they said, oh, we need a policy review. We're going to re review the ordinance and amend it for changes. But that wasn't the problem. The problem was the will, right? So the, the will comes first, and then the policy, right? So when they announced that the governor in his address said that Hong Kong Heritage was going to be you know, given a higher priority, that shook, shook them up and that caused them to get all the civil servants off the board and bring in this kind of mini democratization. But unfortunately, the synagogue issue blew up and that blew that away. And now it's back to 24 appointed members on the AAB. So the only thing I can think of is that you know, one has to just press for more proper representation as opposed to appointed members on the on the advisory boards, on the Hong Kong U Council, everywhere that you find it. Right? <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.